Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Houston Young Lawyers Association event, Adjudicating Bankruptcies, Topics and Trends in the Southern District of Texas. I'm Ryan Killian, and I co-chair the Ju Judiciary Committee, along with Melanie Guzman. Karen Beckham-Moody, a bankruptcy attorney, is on our committee and moderating, moderating with me today. It's my honor to introduce our panelists. I'll start with Judge Marvin Isger. Judge Isger is the longest tenured member of the court. He took the bench in early 2004 and was appointed to his second 14-year term in 2018. During that time, Judge Isger has served as the sole bankruptcy judge on the Judicial Conference Committee on Court Administration and Case Management, a post to which he was appointed by Chief Justice Roberts. Currently, he is one of the two judges assigned to handle complex cases in the Southern District of Texas. Judge Isger earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Houston in 1974 and an MBA with honors from Stanford University in 1978. He had a successful career before going back to the University of Houston to pursue a JD, which he earned in 1990. He then spent 14 years in private practice before being appointed to the bench. Judge Chris Lopez only recently left private practice. He spent 16 years at Wild Gotchland Manges, where he handled a large number of major Chapter 11 cases. Judge Lopez was appointed to the bench last year and sworn in on August 14th, 2019. So he's just completed his first year on the bench. Judge Lopez is another University, University of Houston graduate, earning his bachelor's degree in 1996. In 1998, he earned a Master of Arts in Religion from the Yale Divinity School. He went to law school at the University of Texas and obtained his JD in 2003. We're very excited to have Judges Isger and Lopez with us today. Thanks to both of you for taking the time to join us. Now, I wanted to start at the very beginning. What attracted you to bankruptcy law? And I'll ask that question of Judge Isger first, because I read somewhere, Judge, that your first brush with this area of law came prior to law school as an expert witness. Is that where it all began? Uh, actually, it was the successful career that you described where virtually everything <laughs> I touched ended up in bankruptcy. And so I ended up uh, managing a large number of entities through bankruptcy court. I was also trying to earn some extra money, and I worked as an expert witness and did some bankruptcy uh, testifying. But it, it was mainly from my personal experience. In the mid-80s, Houston went through a total real estate uh, depression. Uh, the value of commercial properties dropped probably by 60%. And since that was the business that I was in, um, I ended up with a lot of experience in bankruptcy, and I fell in love with it. Uh, so I would correct your description of my career as successful, but it was definitely... Uh, successful in helping me find where I want to be. And one of the places I want to be is working with Chris, who's been here a year and has been just a great partner to have. And Chris, how did you get into bankruptcy law? I was one of those that couldn't figure out whether I wanted to get into corporate or, or litigation. And so as a summer associate, I, I just decided to try out bankruptcy because I knew from what I was told that I could get into court early and still, you know, get involved in complex commercial transactions um, and still take a deposition. So I, I thought that um, it just made a, a, was worth a try. And, and as I got in there, I, I realized how much I enjoyed it. I liked learning about new companies. Um, the fact that cases, you know, kind of come in and come out. Um, some cases can last long for a long period of time and you have to really learn an industry like an airline um, or sometimes you can have a, an oil and gas case. And so, you know, you just never know what's gonna come in the door or what issues you're gonna have to deal with, but it's really fun to learn about different, different industries. And that's what I've really attracted me. So speaking about, I guess, the breadth of issues that you face as bankruptcy judges, could you talk a little bit to us about your caseloads? And I know they vary from, you know, some large nationwide companies all the way down to individuals that you're having to deal with on a daily basis. So. I was hoping you could speak to some of the challenges and some of the interesting points of dealing with of something that dynamic. So we allocate our cases here randomly. Um, and I think I can tell you that both when Chris and I came, neither of us had really ever handled a consumer bankruptcy case. Uh, but you show up and, you know, on day one, you're given 3,000 consumer bankruptcy cases. They somewhat dominate your life when you get here, and they especially dominate your life um, for me because when I was new, I needed to learn that area of the law. Chris was smart enough to learn a lot of it before he got here, and I was not. 
uh, but it really became a passion of mine to work on the consumer cases. So roughly 3,000 consumer cases, probably another four or 500 miscellaneous cases, and then probably a couple of hundred very large uh, business cases is what my docket looks like. Yeah, and I have about, I think about 3,500 of the chapter 13 cases, um, a little over 100, 200 of the, uh, actually a growing number of um, chapter seven liquidation cases and um, a fair number of, a growing number of, of chapter 11 cases are as well. As you can imagine, you know, I started with, you know, just a few chapter 11 cases. And as I got on the rotation for a, over the course of a year, as cases have filed, I've, I've gotten my fair share of those as well. Uh, but the first day that I was sworn in, um, Judge Costa congratulated me at about an hour later, I had 100 people <laughs> in my courtroom uh, on, a, on a consumer docket. So that was um, an incredible challenge for me. And I wanted to jump in real quick to tell our audience, there is a Q&A function. So if you want to ask any questions, I will be um, building those and trying to get them relayed to the judges. And so do you guys mind t hitting on, I guess, some of the differences in caseloads that you preside over? I know Judge Lopez, you said you deal with liquidating chapter sevens and Judge Isker, I know you're on the complex panel. Could you briefly touch on, I guess, the differences in between those caseloads? Um, well, first probably should explain a little bit about what they are. Uh, when a company is unable to stay in business, it will file chapter seven and I don't currently have a very large docket of chapter seven cases as part of the equalization effort that we've made on the workload. Um, all the bankruptcy judges here, by the way, are working pretty hard right now, but uh, the chapter 11 cases are companies that are trying to reorganize their debts and stay in business. And those cases are typically uh, situations where you'll have a very large number of lawyers participating in any one hearing. Uh, as a practicing lawyer, I didn't ever get involved in these giant cases that I'm now seeing as a judge. On the other hand, Chris was involved in those. Judge Lopez was involved in those as a practicing lawyer and would appear before me, which was awfully exciting to have him come here. Um, but we could have 150 lawyers showing up for any given hearing. Um, that actually works pretty well by audio and video these days. Um, but you have a large number of constituents and you're trying to figure out pretty complex financial instruments. A huge percentage of the disputes though in those big cases are, are resolved by settlements. And so on occasion you'll have a long trial. Um, I finished a trial this morning about 45 minutes ago. It had been a five day multi-witness trial and then this afternoon at four o'clock I'm gonna announce the results of that trial. So we do have some of those, but I think in the last, so far since COVID, I've had two trials that have lasted longer than five days, but most things are done more quickly than that and most things by agreement. Judge Lopez? Yeah, and for me, um, you know, in light of the, the great number of uh, consumer cases and, and all the judges not just see cases here in Houston, but we also, um, have cases outside of outside of the district. Um, you know, for example, I'm I'm in also handle the, the bankruptcy cases that are filed in, in Victoria. Um, Jajiska handles cases um, in in Corpus. You know, somebody's got to handle the bankruptcy cases in Laredo, McAllen, Brownsville. So, um, and in Galveston. So each of the judges, there's five of us. Each of us handle cases here in Houston, and also handle the dockets that are are in in other courts as well and so likely see us go one one or two two times of the month um to two parts outside of the uh, outside of the district here outside of the city of houston i should say um you know i, I am seeing and it's really interesting uh, and really fascinating um a, a large number of just the consumer cases obviously COVID has has created um new challenges um for for individuals um, but also for for companies i think anyone who comes downtown and just tries to grab a bite to eat, you can see that, um, you know, a lot of, you know, for example, Cafe Express isn't there anymore. Um, there's a bunch of places that you think are, are there and they're not there anymore. Uh, and there are entire industries that were built upon 
people showing up to work at a particular location and they're not there anymore. So, you know, we're starting to see some of the effects of, of the reality of, of what COVID has done, um, but also just your traditional, you know, I expanded too quickly um, kind of issues. Um, that, so it, it really does vary. So last week, um, we both received a notice from the Administrative Office of the United States Courts that they run statistics on how busy courts are, and they run them not based on how many judges there are, but how many judges you're authorized to have. Uh, we're authorized to have six judges, although we've only filled five positions. We're one of the few districts in the country that hasn't filled in all of its positions. If we had all six, we would be the second busiest court in the country in terms of caseload. And they said, why don't you go up to six? And we said, no thanks, we like our team. So uh, we're staying at five, and uh, I, they didn't run those statistics, but I suspect that makes us the busiest uh, caseload. Per, that's on a per judge basis in the country. Uh, did you happen to? Did you look at that, Chris? Or? I did not. Yeah, but I mean, it's. it's uh, I didn't run the numbers, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that makes us the busiest caseload in the country, and I think we're all keeping up. Judge Lopez, you touched on uh, the consumer panel. And I know when I was clerking for Judge Isker, that was one of my favorite days of the week, just because you saw such a diversity of people come in with so many different issues. And could you touch on what a consumer panel is for you guys and, and how that process works? Yeah, and every judge kind of runs their own panel differently. Um, but I and, and Judge Isker, for example, um, will have panel hearings um, twice a month um, and during those panel hearings, you could have 150, 200 different individual cases before, and we call each and every one of them. Um, and so the debtor, um, along with their attorney or sometimes pro se, will show up and either seek to confirm their Chapter 13 plan, um, or if they've fallen behind on payments on a confirmed plan, uh, either seek to modify that plan, um, and if you're two payments behind, um, the chapter 13 trustee who's assigned in, in every individual um, case uh, will file a motion to dismiss your case because you're not making payments in accordance with the plan to pay creditors. Um, and sometimes folks just try to tell you their story and tell you they need a little bit more time. Um, and what is fascinating is that every case is, is different. People, what I learned, I, all I did was, you know, before I got on the bench was um, work with large chapter you know, chapter 11 company. So I was quite frankly, often, you know, dealing with CFOs, CEOs, or financial advisors, that, that was the world that I lived in. And, and I stepped into a world where, you, where you're looking at someone, and, you know, you have the power to either, you know, put, the, you know, someone's coming in there saying, you know, I want to foreclose on their home. And you have the power to say yes, or, or no. And, and, and it's an incredibly humbling uh, and, and scary power. Um, that the bankruptcy judges have, and, and you've got to, you know, you've got to follow the law, but you also have to listen to people. So we, we call individual cases and we listen to the stories and, you know, you, you make a determination based on the facts and the law in every case. But um, a panel hearing could go from 9 a.m. to 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, it will take an incredible amount of time. Um, and I, I think Judge Isco would agree with me here that, you know, the job if you really want to know what we do, I mean, we're really um, consumer judges, you know, it takes an incredible amount of time dealing with the cases and litigation that emerges from those cases. The chapter 11 cases are what makes the Southern District of Texas kind of famous, but the real work uh, for every judge um, is really kind of the consumer work. And it's the one that really creates the emotional tug when you go home at night. You, you think about those cases much more because they're real faces and there's real issues. Um, so, yeah, so I, I know Judge Lopez and I both prepare for those hearings pretty extensively. And basically, in most situations, you know if you're going to take away somebody's home before that hearing gets held. And we certainly would be authorized, based on the pleadings, to issue an order that says, you know, your case is dismissed, you're losing your home. Uh, I made a decision when I came that I would never take away somebody's home without giving them a chance for a hearing. There are rare occasions when what I think I'm gonna do before I get out there, they'll change my mind on. 
but I just think it's so important that if you're going to take someone's house away or their car away, they need to get to work. They ought to have the chance to come in and talk. Uh, they ought to understand why you ruled. I mean, we shouldn't just look at a guy or a family and say, you lose, you're losing your home, you know. We ought to tell them, here's what's going on, and this is why you're losing your home. This is why you can't keep your car. Um, and it's very hard sometimes. But I've kept, this was a word I kept to myself, and I think I've kept my word to myself. And I give people a chance to tell me why they shouldn't lose, even if it's obvious that they're going to, to give them their proverbial day in court. And Judge Lopez, I'm not sure exactly if you feel the same way, although I suspect. Oh, 100%. 100%. Sort of moving, I guess, to the other end of the spectrum, uh, the Southern District of Texas is now a hotspot for large, complex commercial cases that are filing. And I wanted to get both of your thoughts on, Judge Lopez, you obviously practiced here for a long time, and Judge Isker, you're on the complex case panel, about why the Southern District has become kind of this hotspot for large companies to file in. So let me, let me take a crack at that one, um, because I've sat in hundreds of rooms where those decisions were made, where a, a debtor can file, where they're incorporated, which is why you see so many cases filed in, in for example, in Delaware, um, you know, where principal assets are located or where their headquarters are. So, you know, theoretically a large company could have many different places, um, venues in, in which it could file. My experience um, in, in that decision um, really, the reason I think the Southern District of Texas became a, a great hot spot, as you called it, is, you know, quite frankly, two of the finest judges in America uh, are presiding over those cases, right? So you, you want competency um, if you're a large company who can, you know, who's concerned, you know, what's going to happen? Do these judges, are they going to care about my, uh, my industry and, and what's important to me? And you have two of the finest judges in America presiding there. So th that um, takes... Uh, a great deal of, um, you know, pressure off of, uh, of, of, a, of a lawyer to recommend the Southern District of Texas as, as a filing location. The other thing is, I, I think you, you get consistency, um, you know, it, not favoritism, but, but consistency, right? You, you, you can appear in front of Judge Isker or Judge Jones, and, and, and they're not make ruling this way one day and then the next day on the same issue ruling uh, on the exact same set of facts a different way. So, so I think that there, there's an established at least consistency, um, you know, um, be between the judges on, on certain issues. Um, and again, facts change things. And so that, you know, there's no guarantees, but what I'm trying to say is that some days you represent the creditor, some days you represent the debtor and, and you don't want a judge, you know, wh where you can't figure out, you know, which way they're going to go. So I think, um, I also think that, and this isn't, you know, a really great credit to, to the judges who have, before I got here. So I take zero credit about this, but I've, you know, I've benefited from it as a practitioner and I was a judge. The Southern District of Texas has been way ahead on technology, um, way ahead of the game on, on that stuff than, than any, many other districts across the country. So why is that important? Because, you know, I think, you know, sometimes it's easier to hold a video conference if you had to, or telephonic conferences were, were routinely held here. So, you know, if people all across the country know that they can get a hearing. There's a, our dial-in number for our courts are free and they're publicly available. You don't need to ask for permission or go get, you know, someone to, to give you a passcode to get into it. It's available on the website. Anyone can dial in at any time. So if Ryan Killian got, you know, hired 30 minutes before a case, Ryan could just look up Marvin Isker's dial-in number and dial right into the hearing and, and hear exactly what's going on um, and not have to get on a plane to, you know, to figure it out. It's incredible convenience. Um, and then I think we have some of the best United States trustees in the United States. And I think when you put all of that together, you get a place um, where, look, judges have done it before. They've handled large chapter 11 cases. Um, case managers are incredibly responsive. Um, so, so you call, somebody will give you an email or call you back right away. Um, you put all of that together, you create an environment where both creditors and debtors feel, you know, I don't know how, well, how Isger's going to rule, but he's going to give me a fair shake and I can put my case in front of him 
and he'll, I know he'll hear me and rule on the facts and the law. That is what makes the Southern District of Texas so special. So I, I want to give some credit, though, to Judge Jones on, on this one. Um, he basically um, took the position with me and uh, convinced me to go along with him that this was his concept, that the court should be a customer service oriented court. And as Judge Lopez said, this applies equally to debtors and creditors. So if a creditor or a debtor need an emergency hearing, they can call either of our case managers and they can get a preliminary date for that hearing. So you know, let's say that it, they say it's a big emergency, they've got to have a hearing tomorrow. The case manager will give them a hearing tomorrow. Now, it's up to us as to whether we're really going to hear it in the sense that they may show up and we may say it's not really an emergency. Uh, there is no side favoritism on that. So the debtor is no more likely to be able to get an emergency hearing than a creditor is to get an emergency hearing. And I've never been in the case placing situation that Judge Lopez has been in. Um, but it's my understanding, and he should correct me if I'm wrong about this, that rarely does the debtor make a decision in a billion dollar case without conferring with its creditors where to go. Now the debtor may end up saying, I don't care what you want. I'm going to New York, I'm going to Southern District of Texas. But why would you pick that fight in the beginning? And so absent some compelling reason, because it is the debtor's choice, the whole idea in one of these big cases is to reach a coalition of creditors that you can work with to try and bring everybody into the reorganization scheme. And so if you were to have your major bank group say, you know, no, we don't want to go to the Southern District of Texas because we can never get hearings there. You know, or if the debtor thought they could never get hearings, and I'm using that as just one of many customer service examples. I think it would be a hard decision for the debtor to say, no, my bankrupt group really doesn't want Houston, but I'm going to go to Houston anyway. You know, maybe that happens, but I, I and again, I've never been there, but I bet that's rare. And so I think by having, uh, no favoritism per side, either on customer service or on substance. I mean, I'd, I'll let others tell me, but I don't think I'm a pro-debtor judge or a pro-creditor judge. And so by being what I hope is a, uh, somebody that's going to listen to the arguments, um, I would assume that helps too. And I'll let Judge Lopez, who's been there, and, and, and you, Karen, who've now been there, uh, talk about whether that decision is in fact more of a group decision than what the public perceives of I think the public perceives debtors are running to one court or another, and I, I really doubt that's a unilateral decision. So, Judge Lopez, what do you think? No, no, no. You're, you're, no, you're 100% correct. Um, especially, you know, if a debtor wants to file a large case and, you know, have the bankruptcy case, the length of the case really minimized, you're having conversations well before, um, you know, it, it, it comes as a surprise, you know, that a large company would file for bankruptcy, but not among the professionals. Everybody knows that something is happening and people are reaching out to each other. Um, and again, if, if, your real, if your real interest is to land into Chapter 11 and transition smoothly with minimal disruptions to your operations, then, you know, talking to folks before you file makes, just makes an incredible amount of sense. Um, so that on the first day, you can get a certain amount of relief with minimal objection. And um, the way you do that is by having conversations before the case is filed. Sometimes you yeah. can't. Does that include venue conversations though? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely it does. Absolutely. It's, it's, it'll be the first place your secured creditor group will want to know is where you're going to file. And many times, you're, just, you know, you're, you're sharing pleadings before, before they get filed with the creditor group, right? Especially if they're, you're going to work on, you know, someone's going to lend you money or allow you to use their cash, they're going to want to know what you're asking for and how much in the, in these pleadings. And so it, it happens all the time. Karen, what are you seeing? I, I know you're new at it, but, but you're still seeing this issue, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's really interesting from coming from clerking where I just saw most of the court proceedings, it was totally lost on me how much work goes into getting one of these big cases off the ground and how many different moving pieces there are and how many considerations there are to make and, uh, it's very, really straightforward and it's very often kind of a battle to see, you know, what are the biggest issues and how are we going to address them? 
and the collaboration also is very impressive because I think it's even though it's in an adversarial context, it's not really adversarial. Everybody's kind of rowing the same direction to keep value up for the company and preserve, I guess, a little bit of the piece of the pie for everybody. So it's it's interesting to watch. I guess kind of piggybacking off of that, venue is kind of a hot topic as well. And I was wondering if you could touch on why venue is the way it is, basically. How can a company that only has a mailbox in Delaware gain a foothold to file a large case there where their employees can't come and argue in front of the judge or other creditors may not be able to. And also, what do you think the future holds for the current venue system? So it's built into Title 28 and Title 28 establishes permissive areas of venue. And, uh, judge Lopez earlier went through and He's right, you can file in your state of incorporation, you can file where your principal assets are, you can file where you have you know, major assets, uh, you can file where your creditors generally are. There's just a huge amount of venue discretion and venue is not jurisdictional. So if no one challenges venue, you can probably stay where you filed anyway. Uh, I don't know if that's appropriate behavior, but I suspect it may occur some. Uh, but in any event, there's a wide range of venue choices there are 94 districts in the country, and people are very worried about what court they're in. Uh, there are some judges, and I'll just give an example of one item, that believe it's not appropriate to have first day hearings for due process reasons. First day hearings are typically the hearings that occur right at the commencement of a major case because when that case commences under the bankruptcy code, the entity that filed is prohibited from spending any cash on which th that serves as collateral for a lender. And that means you can't pay anything if you have all your cash uh, that is subject to a collateral agreement. And if you can't get in on day one, you can't assure your employees you're gonna pay them. And you can't pay your vendors, you can't even pay them on a COD basis because that cash isn't free to spend. So if you file bankruptcy in a location where the judge believes that it's inappropriate to hold those hearings, uh, you run the risk that your client's going to quickly go out of business. Now, on the other hand, your lender probably doesn't want you going out of business and you can spend that cash collateral if you have the permission of your lender. So there are ways around it, but your negotiating leverage goes way down if you're totally dependent on consent. So I, there are a lot of difficult choices that, that are there. The statute has been very controversial. Uh, Enron was filed in New York, uh, I think mainly for the reasons that you said, is they didn't want a parade of people you know, wandering around our courthouse complaining about Enron. I wasn't in on that decision. I don't know if Chris was in on that decision or not, but it was a controversial decision here. And there has been a big move to alter that venue statute to make people file where their principal uh, place of businesses where their corporate headquarters is sort of a nerve center test. Uh, a lot of the leaders of that have been, you know, Texas, uh, Senator Cornyn has been a big national leader of that. Um, I hope that his efforts don't change now that Texas has become somewhat of a venue center. Uh, sort of now's the time to strike on that, right? When you're on top is the time to try and settle, and now is the time, I think, to fix what I perceive as a problem, but we have no control over that. If somebody files here and venue is unchallenged, but really, uh, you know, in my own heart, I think it should have been somewhere else, I don't think it's my job as a judge to do that. Uh, it's my job to hear what comes into me and not to raise that issue on my own, so I don't have much control over it. I don't know if Judge Lopez is no, I, it's something I he and I have not thought about much or talked to each other. No, I, I agree with everything you said 100%. I, I really do. Um, got nothing to add on that. I, I agree with everything Judge Isco said. So can we just talk briefly about the appeals process? Because that's also a little bit different than most other courts and that there's an intermediate layer of appeal oftentimes in cases. Uh, could you just briefly touch on what it's like to have a general judge maybe rule on something that's very specific, uh, as specific as bankruptcy laws. 
Okay, Jessica, you probably need to take that one. I've, uh, okay. I've, 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 got, I've got that. Oh, no. I'll let so, you know. <laughs> yeah, first of all, technically, there are three levels of appeal from a bankruptcy judge's decision, maybe. Uh, the first level is to the either district court in certain circuits or the bankruptcy appellate panel in other circuits. And so in, in the majority of circuits now, I believe, the appeals no longer go to the district court. That's a circuit by circuit decision, which I think is craziness, but it is. So it's different in different parts of the country. In the Fifth Circuit, you must appeal only to the district court. District court decisions are appealable to the Fifth Circuit or to the circuit court, and those decisions are appealable to the United States Supreme Court. But having said all of that, they passed a change to that, I believe in 2005, and you can bypass the district court appeal and appeal directly to the Fifth Circuit, but only if the Fifth Circuit agrees and if certain other requirements are met that aren't too surprising as to what those might be. Um, so we go directly into a generalist court at the district court and then into a generalist court at the Fifth Circuit. I happen to think that's better than going to bankruptcy judges to hear the appeals. I think it gives somewhat of a more objective view. Uh, you know, it's the old saying that, you know, if, if all that you have is a hammer, you know, then you're gonna hit a lot of nails. Um, you're gonna think everything is a nail. And so I think, you know, probably my focus is more on bankruptcy than it is on a non-bankruptcy law. And it's not that I intend to ignore those, but having a generalist view, it might make some sense. Judge Lopez, is your appellate record so far unblemished? Is that why you don't wanna? Yeah, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> Invite me next year and I'll give you a little bit more detail, you know? <laughs> you haven't had your first reversal yet? No, no, no. Oh, just wait. It's so much the, of a fun. The night. rite of passage has not happened yet, you know? <laughs> so I actually had a reversal, uh, what was it, probably two years ago, where, or maybe a year and a half ago, where the Fifth Circuit basically wrote, the bankruptcy judge is an idiot reversed. And um, those aren't very fun to get. So, but we get those every so often like that. I think those exact words were that we ignored a monolithic mountain of precedent in rendering our decision. I remember that. That, that was only one of many choice <laughs> phrases that were in that opinion. Now I'll jump in with a quick question from our audience. Have either of you um, engaged with the new small business chapter 11 and if you have what are your thoughts on that so i i've had about six cases and i just held the first day hearing in one yesterday so they are starting um to become more um frequent um before me um, my experience with them is is that it it works really well um but it creates an incredible time pressure. So, so, so the attorneys who are filing them, um, I think they're realizing like how fast deadlines occur in, in, in these cases. So, so for example, the statute um, requires that no later than, than 60 days after the case is filed that there has to be a, a status conference and 14 days before that, they've got to file a status report um, and 90 days into the case, they've got to file a plan, um, a chapter 11 plan. So, so, you know, day one case is filed. Um, you know, you know, you've got something, you know, do 46 days later or 60 days later, and then you got to file a plan 90 days later. And, you know, you always have a deal till you don't. Um, and, and these deadlines can come faster than, than people think. So I think what lawyers are, are, are experiencing and, and as well for me is, you know, staying on top of those deadlines and, and really, you know, to the extent that, a you know, a lawyer can, can kind of hit the ground running on day one and, and already kind of have information because there, there are documents that have to get filed, like schedules of assets and liabilities. And, and, you know, there could be hearings, there could be other parties coming in, you know, not very happy that you filed the chapter 11 case. And so th there are things that could happen during that case that, really, really, um, uh, I think, you know, make these cases go faster than, than people think they are. At the same time, I think there's an incredible cost savings if, if a lawyer does a case right, because chapter 11 uh, is not 
cheap. It, it costs, right? Lawyers do work and lawyers need to get compensated for, for their work. And, you know, to, to do a good job, it takes a lot of time. I always tell clerks and, and young lawyers, I know we're getting, you know, things always take longer than you expect them to. So um, I think, you know, it, there could be an incredible cost savings if you're able to put together a plan and, you know, the code has some restrictions, then um, built in some restrictions um, and excluded certain provisions that in a large chapter 11 case you would have to comply with. So it, it's, it's made for speed, but be careful what you ask for. You know, you got to be aware of, of deadlines that, that come in quicker. Yeah, con Congress has chosen not just in small business 11s, but in a lot of places in the bankruptcy code to put um, very severe deadlines and often, not always, but often we don't have much discretion to move those deadlines. So I would really encourage people, if, if there are deadlines and if you're fairly new to the bankruptcy practice, don't assume that you're in a civil case where the judge can automatically give you more time. Uh, it's often impossible or, or difficult to do that. Yeah, and, and I would say like in these, in these subchapter five cases, like if, you know, I, I, we can extend some of these deadlines, but but it's, I think the standard is is that the debtor should not justly be held accountable, right? Like, so, you know, it, it, you can't just come in and, you know, throw yourself at the mercy. You've got to come up with a good excuse and that's written into the statute. So, you know, some judges are going to read that real literally, you know, and some could be a little bit more flexible, but you, you got to come in with a good excuse and it can't just be judge. I didn't realize that this was the deadline. That's what I mean. Which means that you have a you have to have a current version of the code. Other than that, you won't see this provision in there. So, you if you got a code from a couple of years ago and you think it works, it doesn't. You got to in these subchapter five cases, you got to find the right you know, a 2020 code. So, anyway, my advice for the day. Kind of touching on that, uh, since we have so many new attorneys here in the audience, if you could talk about some advice that you have for new lawyers. I know bankruptcy is one area that you touched on earlier where young attorneys do get a chance to speak and they get to appear in court and their hearings are frequent and often, which is kind of counter to the nationwide trend of civil litigation. So could you touch on some tips and tricks that you have for young attorneys and some pitfalls that maybe you've seen young attorneys fall into? So let me take a crack at this one. Um, first, I, to me, I think young attorneys, regardless of the field, you know, you got to know that you, you're important and, and, and you do have value. You know, you may not be an expert in the area of the law, um, but you can, you can really contribute to a team and it will help you professionally if you get yourself involved in the case, whatever case you're on, right? You know, there's a difference between, you know, looking at a pleading and writing a memo on it and really diving into what that pleading was asking for and, and taking a look and seeing what was going on in the case um, and providing value at it in that way. You just never know when someone's not going to know something and, and you could be that person. Um, so, so, and you know, a lot of times, you know, partners haven't read cases, right? They're expecting you to read the cases. And so I think there's a difference between saying, I found a case that says this and really reading the case to make sure that there's not something else in there um, that goes contrary to your position or that, um, it's not simply just, you know, I guess what we used to call shepherdizing or checking to make sure that the case hasn't been overturned. It's really diving into the facts and really becoming a master of whatever's in front of you. Um, I think is you, you can provide incredible value and become incredibly important and indispensable in a case because you have the documents, you have the cases. And so the other piece of advice I'll give you is I'm telling you, it always takes longer than you think. And so if you've got a memo um, or a pleading that's due on a Thursday at noon, you know, give yourself, tell yourself that it's due on Wednesday because, you know, things always take longer than, than they do. Introductions, conclusions, they take longer. Writing a statement of facts takes longer than you do. And until you get comfortable in your own skin and figure that out, um, do not give yourself till Thursday at noon to try to get a memorandum now. You want to edit it and things you really really have to kind of think about those things and when you're preparing for court you know look if you really want to do a good job it's going to be lonely you're going to be lonely at you know at the office late at night or, or early in the morning you know you want to know everything about the the very pleading that you're 
presenting on, um, which, you know, I, I've seen Judge Isker ask people questions about the very sections of the bankruptcy code um, that you're talking about. And it's, it could be an uncontested matter, but there could be something in the pleading that raises a question. You want to be the associate uh, who has seen, you know, and, and read the statute, asked questions about the statute. Um, and the last thing I'll tell you is, you know, it is foolish to not ask questions. It is foolish to, to not ask questions if you don't understand. Um, for clarity purposes, um, telling a, you know, going to you know, an office mate and saying, hey, I'm wrestling with this issue. Like, that's what I did as a judge. Um, things I didn't know, I called Judge Isker and called Judge Jones and asked around. They're, they're the experts. Um, it'd be foolish for me to have an incredible team around me and, and not avail myself of it. So, you know, wrestle with the issues, but when you need to ask questions, ask the questions. You don't get extra points for saying that you really tried really hard and you didn't get the answer, right? You, you get points for saying, I wrestled with the issue and someone, and look, the job is done. Well done, you know? That's, that, that's my advice to young lawyers. I, I just want to agree with everything Chris said and, and maybe even expand on it a stronger level to emphasize a couple of things. If this is going to be your first hearing, don't stand up and tell me it's not important. Don't tell me it's a routine motion. And it's important. If your client needs this relief, it's important. Um, number two, you should have read everything that's about this motion. You should know every word in the proposed order that you have. And you should be the most prepared person in the courtroom. There should never be anything about that motion that I know and you don't know. Uh, number three, I'm going to, if this is your first hearing, I will do my best to find a question to ask you. I, I probably will realize it's your first hearing. And it's not that I'm going to look for a hard question that you can't answer. I'm going to just find something that I think happens to be interesting about whatever you're doing. And I'm going to ask you about it. It is not to trip you up. But it's because if this is your first year, you need the chance to talk. And it is so embarrassing if I ask a lawyer a question, which again, I always try and do at their first hearing, and they haven't read enough to know the answer to that. So don't put yourself there. Uh, and finally, as you're writing the motion to prepare for your first hearing, one tip just from practice for me is, why am I writing that motion? What am I hoping to get? And the only way to answer that question is if the first thing you write is the order. If the order shouldn't say the motion is granted, the order should say the debtor is authorized to do X and describe what it is, or judgment is for the plaintiff for a hundred thousand dollars, or you know, the debtor's discharge is denied. Whatever that decree is that you want, that should be the first thing you write. And then there should be nothing in your motion that doesn't guide the court to why it shouldn't grant that order. If you start by writing a motion and end with writing an order, you're not gonna do the right thing. Start with writing the order and then write the motion. Let me just add one thing, and, and I say this to, to anyone who appears in as a bankruptcy practitioner or, or some other, you know, I came out of law school in 2003 and, and I'm only speaking for kind of the really, really large firms. I, you know, when I got out, it was eight years before I was allowed to say anything in court. I was there to draft and to, to get things done. And so, you know, there's been a tremendous shift and I'm incredibly excited about that where, where young lawyers are getting opportunities to appear in bankruptcy courts. It's quite frankly encouraged by, by the judges, um, but man, if you've got a shot at, at doing something that took me eight years to, to, to get a shot for, and I was billing incredible hours and doing everything, you know, and you got a shot to do that on you know first, second year, take full advantage of that opportunity because they just were not there. It wasn't because, you know, it's because, you know, some large company CEO wanted to see, you know, the, the hot shot that they hired come in there and argue it, right? They wanted to see someone with gray hair come in and, and, and argue all the motions. They were not interested in giving uh, a young Chris Lopez an opportunity, didn't care, right? Just don't wanna see you. That's not what I'm paying for. I'm paying for 
you know, her, you know, she's been, she's been doing this for 25 years. She's the one that I hired and um, that's who's going to come in and argue it. And that's the way things were. Things have shifted. Take full advantage of those opportunities, but don't come into court and not be prepared. Like that's the one thing that you can surely take control of, you know? Yeah, it's going to be lonely. You may have to spend the night up late, later than you wanted to, get up earlier than you wanted to. But I'm telling you, it, you know, you, you do it once. People always remember when you did a good job, you know? People always remember when you're unprepared as well, you know? Your client will see it because your client's going to be there as well. And so just take full advantage of, of an incredible opportunity that I'm so excited that many of you have. I guess one more point that I saw when I was clerking a lot for numbers and lawyers always like to say the joke. I went to law school because I don't like numbers, but it seems like so many of these cases turn on what's on a spreadsheet. So could you talk about a good way to help people prepare for what to do when they're, com I guess, confronted with complex math problems or things like that that they may not be totally comfortable with? I think that's a hard question. Uh but you should never stand up and say you don't do numbers. I just think that's, don't do that in a bankruptcy court. We're there about numbers. If you're not familiar with numbers, you need to learn them. Um, if you don't know what a balance sheet is and you don't know what an income statement is and you don't know how to produce a statement of cash flows by looking at an income statement, a balance sheet, you should learn it. Uh, there are plenty of online courses for that. There are plenty of books for that. Uh, but I would not be afraid of numbers. And, um, you know, I, I do a little thing for consumers every couple of years called numbers for lawyers. You know, is a debit a credit? Is a credit a good thing? Is a debit a good thing? How do those work? And um, you shouldn't assume that you know what those words mean. You should learn it. Um, you can learn it. Judge Lopez, I mean, what do you think about numbers? No, no, no I, I agree. And, and that's one of the things that I, I, I tell you, um, you know, I learned that on my own, you know, and I, that, that was something that I, I sat back over, you know, over a couple of years and, and, and learned that on my own. Um, and, but, you know, you can't bill for that, but, but if you want to get really good at what you want, then you're going to have to really invest the time into that, you know, and look, and on a related point, um, I think, you know, investing and a couple of good books on writing, uh, seeking every opportunity you can to, to improve your writing skills um, is invaluable, you know? And, and that's not something that, you know, you, you can't build for that either, right? You, you're gonna have to like really work on honing your craft, but if you take what you do really seriously, right? Then, then you do that, right? Chefs prepare meals all the time, you know, and, and just go to waste, but, um, they're trying to hone their skill. And, and I think reading good writing um, is important. I think, you know, reading books on grammar uh, are incredibly important. And I can tell you as a judge who's kind of just gotten here on this side, um, you know, like all the, the jibs and the jabs on the other side are, are incredibly meaningless to me. Like all, you know, you know, cut down on the adverbs um, and tell me what's really important and why, you know, and if, and if you find a really good case, tell me it's really important and, and tell me why because I'm trying to get the right answer. Um, and I, you know, I get it, the other side, you don't like them and your client doesn't like them. And I also know the pressures that exist when a client is really upset at the other side and, and they want you to put some zingers in there. Um, there's a way to do that and not come across as losing your credibility uh, or don't think that that's swaying the judge in any way. I'm parsing through all of that and trying to figure out exactly what you're asking me and why. Um, and so I think, you know, saying things, you know, so that anyone can understand, because when we write, we're trying to, you know, Judge Isker does a great job at this as well. And, and as I'm developing my own writing style, um, and it's one of the things that Judge Costa told me, I, you know, he always writes with the losing party's client in mind, you know, can they understand it and why, as opposed to taking jabs, you know, re writing with consideration, but really effective writing is writing that makes sense. So you got to understand the numbers, but that's going to, yeah, it may take time, but get it done. You know, no, no one, and uh, if you don't understand writing, how to get, become effective writer, um, take time. It takes longer than you think. It'll always take longer than you think, but you'll get good at it. So Judge Lopez, let's assume that you're having a colloquy with a young lawyer and that 
you just made a statement, you, Judge Lopez, just made a statement of law that's wrong, or you made a statement about when something occurred and it's wrong. So the young lawyer's there and they know you're wrong. How do you want them to tell you that? I think there's a, in the, in the middle of a colloquy, I think you should just say, well, you know, Your Honor, as, as I read this statement, um, you know, I, I take a look at this and we, if you look at page X of this order, it, it says something different. Like, we want to get it right. Um, and so I, I don't think you should be afraid of telling me that, that I got it wrong. If I got it wrong, tell me. Um, and and I, obviously, you, you know, you can show respect and, you know, but tell me, do not leave there without telling me that I got it wrong. If I got it wrong, there's a way you can communicate that and don't shy around it. Um, judges want to get things right. Um, and I think, tell me, you know, Your Honor, can we take a look at page 10? Because I, I read it differently. Or Your Honor, I respectfully disagree. Uh, I think, you know, the numbers add up in a different way. That, that's not being disrespectful. That's advocating effectively for your client. And if the judge got it wrong, you got to tell him or her. I would also think it's, to me, it's disrespectful not to tell us that because then we're going to make a mistake and we really don't want to do that. And if, if you don't have enough respect for us to think that we can listen to somebody telling us we're wrong without getting upset about that, that says you don't respect us at all. Um, we should not be eager to make mistakes, right? It's, there really is a goal to get it right and speak up, let us know. He's kind of transitioning to our last topic here since we're running low on time. Uh, COVID and how has COVID impacted the cases that you've seen, the caseload you've seen, and where do you think we're going to go from here? So, Jessica? so I, I think we're going to see long-term structural changes in the way courts operate. Uh, we already have now published new uh, complex rules for the bankruptcy court, where we have said that at these first day hearings that we talked about earlier, on a permanent basis, those can occur by video and audio. Um, it has made so much more sense to do it that way. I've got hearings at two o'clock today on a case that got filed uh, yesterday morning around 10, I think. And it is a case where it's a UK company with Houston headquarters that operates on six continents around the world. And I'm gonna have hearings this afternoon at two. And I'm doing that whether there's COVID or not. And in non-COVID days, these airplanes used to be filled with people trying to come to this hearing about a $7 billion case. And it really, if you think about it, we had to hold the hearing because I said, you gotta be able to pay the employees for God's sake. You can't not hold those hearings. And so everybody felt a need to show up. And so now we're trying to tell people you know what, it works just fine when we do this by audio and video. And so we're gonna change that. Um, I got an email from one of my fellow judges this morning, I won't say which one, who said, chapter 13 is working really well where we're not making debtors miss work. Should we consider permanently allowing our debtors to appear by audio and video so they're not having to miss work? And I believe now all four other judges have responded to say, let's have that conversation. So you know, we haven't made a decision on that because it came up at, when was that, 11 o'clock this morning or 10.30 this morning? Uh, but all of us immediately said, yeah, let's think about whether we need some long-term structural changes to reflect what we have now learned or things we can do well without, uh, and we've learned that solely because of COVID. Yeah, and Jen, the only thing I'll add is, is on, the, on the consumer side, it, Obviously, I'm coming downtown. I see, you know, those little convenience stores, they're all hurting. So I, I think we're gonna see the effects of that for, for years to come. Um, it's also been incredibly emotional, holding hearings where you're calling the next case and someone has now started to say, your honor, um, my client passed away because of COVID. Um, that has been incredibly emotionally difficult um, for me to kind of, just the reality of, of, of life happening and, and yeah, you know, I'm a judge and, and that's great, but my goodness, somebody just passed away um, and families are, are dealing with that and it's, it's, been, it's been tough. So I think what we're trying to do is just trying to make this as easy as possible to keep everyone safe 
um, and, and realizing that, that, you know, that there's real life going on outside and people are hurting. And that has hit very close to our court family too. Um, many of you may know that we've lost both a quorum security officer and uh, Diane Livingstone, who many of you may have known over the years to COVID, uh, who was an assistant United States trustee. So um, Chris is right. Uh, times are hard. Well, I think it's just about one o'clock. So I think that's about as much time as we'll take from you guys, but wanted to extend our sincere appreciation for you taking time out of your busy days and sitting down to speak with us here. It really means a lot. Yeah, yeah, we certainly appreciate it. And thank you so much and, and best of luck with, with all of your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. And for everybody, the uh, course number for today's CLE is 1740950051. Uh, thank you, Judge Isker. Thank you, Judge Lopez. This has been great. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.